that. I'm sure all of you would remember the Polaroid days uh, when we actually, you know, didn't have to put stuff in the cloud. You just took pictures and then you would mark those moments, right? And so the, the beauty of these things, of course, is you get, to, you get to put a little label down here to, you know, vacation 2015. Uh, or something like that. And uh, it's pretty cool because, you know, it's a, a quick little way to sort of remember it. Um, when, you, when I think in terms of, like, the past, this idea of a picture always comes to my mind. It's the past is like a whole series of moments, uh, but, but a photo captures like a frozen moment in time. And, and so, like, long before you, you would do, like, your own phone with selfies, people tried to do them even with these. You'd be like... And uh, then you'd, you'd be like, oh, wow, it didn't, it didn't work. I don't know why. Um, and so then, you know, then, of course, you'd be like, come on, let's go through. Come on, come on. And I don't even know if any of that speeds it up, but we, all st- we, we did all of this. And, so, and, and these moments in time, these frozen moments in time, they, they're beautiful when they're a happy memory of your past and a vacation. And, and sometimes you'll even forget what the photo was about or when it was. It, this is like back, I'm going way back, before like geotagging and things like that on your, uh, on, on your photos. This is just the way it was. And so what happens, I think, in our minds is a very similar process. Like we, we see something uh, in our past or we experience something or you remember something. And sometimes it's fuzzy and sometimes it's crystal clear what it was, and then we label it. And, and so you have these things, these photo boards uh, in your mind that, that have pictures of who you think you are, how you see yourself, the things that people have said to you, that people have done to you, your self-image. Uh, you have these pictures, and you have, a, and you have a ton of them. You actually have way, way more than you might even recognize. Some of them you have been staring at for many, many years, and you've just been kind of there. In the middle of your photo board has been this reminder of who you are. And so who, is, who am I? Well, I, I know a lot of you know that I'm, I'm, one of my self-identities is as an achiever. And so I'm an Enneagram 3. I'm a D on the disc, an ENTJ if you're a Myers-Briggs kind of a person, which... It, for those of you who know what all of those things mean, I should probably just get out ahead of it and apologize now for the offense I'm going to give you at some point in your life. Because all of those things equal up to a person who will in some way, someday, bother and hurt you and disappoint you in some strong way. It's going to happen, right? So the amount of times in my life I've heard, Robert, it's not, it's, not, it's not what you said, it's how you said it. If I had a nickel for every time I heard that, and so, and all of that is part of both the, the beauty and the curse of me and having this sort of achiever mentality. And so I label, I label that picture and I hang it somewhere on my photo board, somewhere in my heart, somewhere in my memory is, is that picture. And it just sits there reminding me of, of who I am. Sometimes it's aspirational. Sometimes it's dragging me down. Sometimes it hurts the people around me. You know, but there's a whole lot of other ones too, right? Because that's not the only one. I, I remember a time where uh, my dad and I were doing some work around the house, and I, uh, I wanted to move a wheelbarrow full of rocks. Very, very heavy. Way more than my small frame at the time could have handled. And my dad knew it, of course, and he's like, you shouldn't move those rocks because if you do, you are going to drop them. And you're going to have to pick them all up. And I'm like, I am not going to drop them. I got this because I had a whole lot of like testosterone now surging through my adolescent body, and I was sure I was going to do it. And of course, I, I didn't. And the look on my dad's face was kind of that look of like, <sighs> again. And I had the sort of like screw-up look where you kind of like look half down and think there was a reason that this could happen. You're like, you know, I'm going to like take a, a, a picture of that moment in my life. What would it be? How, what would that, is that look, is that the look, the screw-up look? You don't really want to look at it, but you kind of, that's the screw-up look right there, I guess. It's not the only one, of course, that I remember. That's, a, that's a one moment in time for me. There were a ton of other stories that have happened throughout my life that I've captured in pictures in my head. There was a time I spent a year on a project here for Beacon. It was a big project. It was going to be pretty pretty uh, significant for us as a church. I put a time, a time and energy and a whole lot in. And uh, yet it failed. 
completely and utterly. Utter, I mean, just complete failure. And that reminded me of a whole lot of other times in my life where the failure gripped me. What will I do with that? Will I take another one? What's the failure look? I don't really know. I try not to do it as an achiever. It hits me, but I... Should I swear you made me smirk, and it's not gonna it's not gonna be a failure picture, but there it is. I would write it out and I would mark these things, and this would be my failure moments. And these would be the times that I've disappointed people over and over and over again. And and over here I, I have the pictures of me as a screw up. And I just add to these throughout the whole of my life. And sometimes I pull out the old ones and I revisit them a little bit and I just kind of like, you know, what's it gonna look like when it really comes comes through. I think of myself as a very tough-minded person. I'm not the sharpest tack in the box, but I can take a punch. That's one of the pictures I have somewhere in there. I don't know. I'm, I'm not, I've never even challenged that picture of myself. One day I came to it, it, it became who I am, and I still say it to this day, something along those lines. I really actually, this is part of my identity. I, I, should, I should think about it. I should challenge it. I should find out if it's true. Maybe I'm not that hard of a worker anymore. I don't know. Maybe I am, it, it, but it, it's, it's in there. And some of these things you've given to yourself, others people have handed you. Sometimes you've accepted them uncritically. You haven't even decided whether or not they deserve to be on your photo board, and yet they still have a prime space sitting right up there. I remember when I told my grandfather that I was not going to be an architect. I was going to go into ministry and be a pastor. And that was not the picture that my grandfather had for his grandson at all. And the look of disappointment in his face, it was, I could, it was palpable. And in that moment, I felt like a disappointment. I felt like a disappointment. It was hard for an achiever who hates failing to see that I was disappointing the people that I wanted to be proud of me. We all do this. Pictures, frozen, in time. What are the pictures that are on your photo board? Because here's the thing, your past is a collection of the things that were done to you and the things that were done by you. That's what the past really is. If you think about it, those memories these are things that you have done to people, done to yourself, and you think these are either good things or these are bad things. And the thing, some of these are really, really great pictures, and you love them, and you, they bring back sweet memories, and others, they're not. They're, they're not good. And some of them are lies. Some of them are straight up true. Most are just a mix of the two. I'm trying to weed out the things that are true and the things that are valuable. So what's on your photo board, this, this photo board of your life, this thing inside of you, what is it? What are the pictures that you go back to and you revisit again and again and again and again and again? What's on your photo board? That's what we're going to be talking about the whole of this series. We're going to be trying to figure out what are those frozen moments in your past? How are they impacting you today? What are we going to do to get past them in a way that brings you into the fullness of who you were meant to be according to God's plan for your life. That's what the whole of this series is going to be. And we're going to go back to this idea in a few different ways over the next couple of weeks, but, but we want to put, you've got all of these different kind of photos that are up. You have all of these snapshots of your life, and, and only you are going to know what they are. Only you. You can go ahead and take your Sharpie out and go ahead and fill them in. Just write in what those things are. And which ones are you going to rip down? And which ones are you going to revisit? And which ones are you going to rename? And which ones are going to get nuanced? Because you're going to want to better understand them. But we want to do one thing. We want to pull one picture front and center for you. One that maybe you've never actually claimed for yourself. Or maybe you did, but it was years ago. Maybe there was, a, there was one time in your life where you really, really, really did believe this. But you have stuffed that photo in a shoebox at the bottom of your closet, and so you haven't seen it for a very, very long time now. It is the picture of the beloved. It's the picture of the beloved 
This is such a beautiful word that comes out of the scriptures. When we were here on, on Good Friday, I hope a whole lot of you were here on Good Friday. I know a lot of you were here on Good Friday. It was a bit of a madhouse, but it was an awesome madhouse. And, and, and that night, we got to talk about the cross and what that means for us. The sacrifice of Jesus on the cross for us. Why would he do that? Why? The Son of God for sinful people. Why? Why would he give us his righteousness? And why would he take our sin and our rebellion? Because we're beloved. Because we are his children. In fact, the Gospel of John is one of our, my absolute favorite. I love the Gospel of John. Listen to this. At the very, very beginning, the very first chapter, he says, but to all who believed in him and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. The whole Gospel of John begins with this idea that you get to become the beloved. The term there for children of God, it's this endearing kind of a term. It's more than simply calling them kids. There is something sweet. There is something tender about it. You're loved. You're beloved. You're, 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 a, very, you're a child. But listen, you're not a child of God by birth, right? That's what it says. You, you, are, you have become, they are reborn, not with a physical birth resulting from human passion or plan, but a birth that comes from God. He gives you the right to become children of God. You can become a child of God by accepting this promise, the cross of Christ for you. That's how you become a child of God. Not everyone is a child of God. You have the right to become a child of God. You can now take this out of the shoebox or maybe for the very first time, maybe that's it, maybe for the very first time for some of you, we get to actually take that picture and we get to say, or smile big guys. I'm going to say, this is not a wide angle. Look at that. All right, so I'm going to have to take your picture over here, and, and I'm going to have to, I guess I'm going to have to take your picture over here too, because this is, I expected that to have a wider angle. And, and so what is this? This is you as beloved of God, and that's what we want. We're going to write this on your picture. We're going to write this in big letters. We're going to say these are the beloved of God because they have chosen to trust in Jesus. They have, been cho they have chosen to trust in the work of the cross. And they have said, I am a child of God. And look, the gospel ends. There are 21 chapters in the book of John. And right here where he says, dear ones, have you caught any fish? Guess what that word is? This word for children again. The whole of the gospel is bookended by this cry of Jesus to say, you can be beloved by God. That is the picture he wants front and center. Until all of the others begin to fade into the background, this is the one that he wants front and center. And when you are the beloved of God, when you are one of his children, then your past is more than what was done to you. It's more than what was done to you. Turn to the person next to you, look them deep in the eyes in a non-creepy way, and say, your past is more than what was done to you. Go ahead and tell them that right now. They need to hear it. No, no, I mean eye contact, lock in there in a non-creepy way. Your past is more than what was done to you. Now turn to the person on the other side, also in a non-creepy way. Your past is more than what was done by you. Tell them that. Someone here this morning needs to hear that. They need to hear it from you, brothers and sisters in Christ that can, are, are telling them, the Savior has told No, do it again. Go ahead, turn around. Turn, the person behind you, tell the person. Back row, you're lucky on this one. Turn around and tell Conrad. More than what was done by you. You see, you are beloved because it's more because your past is also your path forward. Your past is, is also your path forward. And this is like a life hack. This is unbelievably important. So years and years and years ago, more now decades ago, I was uh, working at a church. And uh, there was a lot of, a lot of uh, pain came out of that experience for me. I felt like I had been misled or even lied to when I was hired. I felt like I had proven myself loyal and competent, and felt like I was still distrusted. Then when things really got crazy at this particular church, I ended up having this 
sense of being hung out to dry. And so I was, I mean, I was hurt. Things were done to me and things were done by me that left a whole lot of room for pain and anger and frustration and heartache. But you know, time moves on. I dealt with it, I thought. I kind of put it to rest. And then years later, I ran into one of the guys that I sort of viewed as like chiefly responsible for all of my pain. It was so bad that at one point, I was pretty sure I was leaving ministry. I, I mean, I had, I, I actually remember, I came home, I told Cheryl, you know, we'd been going down this ministry road for many, many years. I had gone to school, I had gotten my master's, I was, you know, had done the applications for a different church. I was, I mean, I, we, this, is our, this was our choice. This is what we were doing. We were committed. It was going to be awesome. It was going to be for the kingdom of God. And, and I came home one day and I said, I think we made a terrible mistake. I don't think this is, I don't think I'm cut out for this, and I'm really frustrated. In fact, I was disappointed in the church as a whole. I was disappointed in Christians, and I, I was frankly really quite upset at God. All of these wasted years, I was just, I was ticked. But you know what? I'm going to get over it. I ran into that guy. Yeah. Not so over it as I thought I was. We're sitting there talking, having a civil conversation, and I'm feeling the heat go up. I'm getting angry. I'm hearing myself get snarky. I'm like actually starting to treat this guy poorly. And I'm like, dude, you got to get a grip here. Like what in the world is going on? It was then, it was only then. This was years later that I realized that, that I had a photo sitting in on my photo board and it was it was labeled bitter and betrayed bitter and betrayed and i hadn't i hadn't dealt with it not in the ways that i ought to have what would become of my pain what will become of your pain what will you do with it will it bring you toward your Savior? Will it make you hide? Will it make you run from people? Will it make you cover up and put on the thick skin and the heavy armor? Increasing isolation? Will it be a path back to your Savior? The one who calls you beloved. What will it be? You see, as a beloved you have been given a new name. You get, to, you get to walk this path of healing into a brand new, renewed future. You get to do that, a new name. This is one of the coolest things where you're reading the Bible. The Bible is filled with tons of awesome stories. If you're not reading it yet, I encourage you to read it. Uh, it's got all sorts of awesome stuff in there. Do a Bible plan. Talk to us afterwards. We'll tell you where to get started. In fact, get started with the Gospel of John. It would be a fantastic place to start. Spend a month just reading through the Gospel of John over and over and over again. It'd be, you, it would, it can, it'll transform your heart. It'll transform your soul, your life, your relationships. You, I'm, I'm telling you, it's amazing. There's a story in there about Peter. Now, most people have heard of Peter, St. Peter. St. Peter's Basilica, like the Vatican, is sort of wrapped around this dude. Um, he's like, you know, the guy. He was like the, the big leader in the early church. He was also an occasional bonehead, which is one of the reasons I really, really like Peter, <laughs> because he just gives us so much hope for uh, the rest of us. But Jesus, the very first time, right, he's talking to, to this guy, Simon, and he renames him. He says, Andrew brought Simon to meet Jesus, looking intently at Simon. Jesus said, your name is Simon, son of John, but you will be called Cephas, which means Peter. And we find out that the word name Peter actually means rock. He's the rock. What a cool name. Like, before the rock was the rock, Peter was the rock. Right? Like, he stole that from the Bible. And so from now on, we should call him Peter or Cephas or whatever. But this, this guy, he was called, imagine meeting Jesus. Jesus is this up-and-coming rabbi, teacher, healer, and he's like, you're the rock. Wow. I am the rock, aren't I? I am the rock. At the very end of the book of John, look at this. After breakfast, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John. Wait a second. 
Is he Simon, son of John? Or is he Peter? We're 21 chapters in. Did Jesus forget that he had renamed him? Is that part of the problem with the resurrection? Like he, he, like, he, he lost a few uh, memories along the way? No. Jesus knows full well what he's doing. In fact, he does it time and again throughout the Gospels, throughout the books of the New Testament. He calls Simon, Simon. He calls him Peter. And often he's just known as Simon Peter. He's been given a new name, but it's an aspirational kind of name. You see, Peter is by personality, by birth, this sort of vacillating and unreliable uh, kind of a guy, right? He's, he's just, he's always running at the mouth. He is mentioned more than anyone in the New Testament besides Jesus. He talks more than anyone besides Jesus. Like, we have more of what he has said. He is rebuked by Jesus more than anyone else is rebuked by Jesus, He is also the only disciple who decided that it was okay to rebuke Jesus, right? Like, imagine that. You're like, just, hey, you know, know, let me tell you how this is really going down, Jesus. Oh, really? Let's do that, Peter. I I mean, Simon. Um, Because that's what he's being Simon now. Like, that's I'm going to call you Simon if that's who you're going to be. No one professed Christ more boldly than Peter. And no one denied him more bitterly than Simon pull back and forth. You've been given this new aspirational name. I mean, so much had been done to Peter. He was born on the other side of the tracks, or in this case, the other side of the lake, the sea, the Sea of Galilee. His people looked down on him. Blue-collar laborer, not that important in society. He was part of an occupied country, an imperialist power, regularly slaughtering the people that he knows and loves in public displays. His friend and hope of the world, Jesus, who called him out and gave him this new name. He watched him killed in front of him while the rest of the band of disciples went to look to him as a leader and said, what do we do now? We have been, we, we, the, Peter, help us. And Simon had nothing for him. Think of the trauma that comes with seeing these things and experiencing this pain and this hurt and all of this misery. And, of course, Peter did a lot of things himself. A whole lot of stuff that was done by Peter also added to his misery and his heartache. At one point, Jesus says, hey, guys, listen, bad news. I'm going to be killed. You guys are all going to be scattered. Peter pulls him aside, and he's like, never. You're never going to be pulled. You're never going to be killed. No way. Not on my watch. I won't let it happen. And Jesus looks at Peter, and he says, get behind me, Satan. What? Peter thinks he's doing the best thing he could possibly do. And Jesus is like, you're acting like the enemy right now. You're acting like the enemy. At one point, Jesus says, you guys are all going to scatter. You know what Peter says? He's like, all of you will desert me. And Peter said, even if everyone else deserts you, I never will. I never will. And one of the lowest moments in the life of Peter, one that he is remembered to for this day. If you know only one thing about Peter, you probably know this about Peter. It was locked in time, a photo taken at one of the moments of his lowest of lows. It was his denial. And here we are in John chapter 18. He says, the woman Ask Peter. This is after Jesus had been arrested. He's already sitting in his trial, and Peter has kind of gotten his way in to observe what's going on here. And he's standing around, and it says, the woman asked Peter, you're not one of this man's disciples, are you? No, he said, I'm not. Because it was cold, the household servants and the guards had made a charcoal fire. It was kind of an interesting moment. You have this, you have this charcoal fire mentioned. And at first, you don't think anything of it because it's just, it's just a charcoal fire. Like, it's just a little detail that an eyewitness would happen to remember. But you realize that, that the narrator here isn't done. John isn't done telling us about this fire. Then Annas bound Jesus and sent him to Caiaphas, the high priest. Meanwhile, as Simon Peter was standing by the fire, here he is by the fire, warming himself, they asked him again, 
you're not one of his disciples, are you? He denied it, saying, no, I'm not. No, I'm not. But one of the household slaves of the high priest, think of this, not anyone important, not a centurion, not a Roman guard, not somebody with a weapon strapped to their side who's going to kill Peter, run him through. A household slave of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, didn't I see you out there in the olive grove with Jesus? Again, Peter denied it. And immediately a rooster crowed. Can you imagine the smell of this charcoal fire, the moment sitting around trying to keep yourself warm, and three times he denies Jesus. Three times. Simon? Peter? Simon Peter? What is going to become of Simon's pain? What's going to become? You know, we had considered leaving ministry, seriously thought about it, prayed about it, wondered about it, make terrible mistakes. Years later, we ended up deciding that we were going to create a new community of faith in the middle of the county. So we moved down to Carl Place, and it was me and my wife, and then it was Conrad and Kelly, and it was just, there were four of us, and then there were six and eight and 12, and then we were meeting in our basement, and we were talking about what would it be like if we were to create a church that had a culture where people could come and with joy find Jesus and, and, and you know, like, kind of not do the weird stuff and be, like, just be the people that could, and, and this idea was being birthed. A lot of it out of my pain. And now today, I watch these kids who are growing up in the faith, and I watch a teenager get baptized, and I realize what it cost to get there. And I'm delighted by it. I'm delighted by it. The cross is a promise to us that the, that the anguish and the suffering that can often seem so meaningless to so many others can actually be used by God to, to do something spectacular or not, because you have a new name. You're no longer victim. You are victorious in Christ. You're no longer going to be the screw-up, but you're beloved. You're the prodigal returning. Wouldn't you want to be part of that story, the returning prodigal? Maybe that's you today. You're not the screw-up. You're the returning prodigal because of the grace of Jesus. You think you're damaged, but you are now more dependent on Jesus than you have ever been. See, he, he can speak into every one of these, these snapshots in your past, and he can give you a new name. He's asking to give you a new name, and he's aspirationally calling you to live by that new name. This is what he does. I mean, he, see, here's the thing. Every single experience, the enemy wants to pull you away from, from Jesus. And Jesus, the power of the Spirit in your heart is using it to draw you closer, a path to Him, to greater intimacy with Him. But there's a, a difficult road that has to happen first because Jesus wants all of you to have all of Him, which means He isn't content to take this little shiny, happy version of you, the mask that you put on for the rest of the world. He is not content to have that version of you at the foot of the cross. You see, all of you, all of your ugly, all of your insecurities, all of that disease, all of that pain, all of that mental illness, all of it, all of those secret thoughts, all of those perverse actions that only you know about, Jesus wants all of them. All of you to accept all of him. He doesn't want any of these things hiding in a shoebox anymore. He wants to bring all of that ugly out into the light. Because that's the only place you're going to be able to take all of that and put it at the foot of the cross. Can you feel the power in this, my friends? Can you feel that? That's what he's doing. He's giving you a new name, and he's saying, I'm taking all of that, and I want all of you. Don't hide any of it from me. Bring it all. Let's see the ugly. Because I've given you a new name. Later, Jesus appeared to the disciples beside the Sea of Galilee. This is how it happened. Several of the disciples 
we're there. This is the very last chapter in the book of John. This is a crazy moment here. He says, Simon Peter said, I'm going fishing. We'll come too, they all said. So they went out into the boat, but they caught nothing all night. At dawn, Jesus was standing on the beach, but the disciples couldn't see who he was. When you imagine this moment, put yourself in that scene. Jesus at the shore. He's calling out to the disciples. He says, and this, by the way, this word for fellows, same word for children, beloved. Have you caught any fish? No, they replied. He said, throw out your net on the right-hand side of the boat and you'll get some. So they did, and they couldn't haul in the net because there were so many fish in it. Then the disciple, Jesus' love, said to Peter, it's the Lord. Then Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord. He jumped into the water and he headed to shore, even though the rest of the guys still had a whole load of fish they needed to bring in. But whatever, Peter. The others, Jesus just gave them the fish. And Peter's like, good luck, guys. The others stayed with a boat, pulled the load net, loaded net to the shore, for they were only about 100 yards from the shore. And when they got out, they found breakfast waiting for them. Fish cooking over a charcoal fire. Charcoal fire. Here it is. Two times it's mentioned in the whole Gospel of John, this word for charcoal fire. Two chapters earlier, it was the scene of the denial of, Je of, the, of Peter's denial of Jesus. And here, Jesus is sitting at this charcoal fire. He's already prepared a meal. And you think, oh, come on, that's reading a little bit into the text here. It's just, you're, you're reading just a bit more into it than maybe is here. And then look at what we see. Bring some of the fish that you've caught, Jesus said. Now, come and have some breakfast, he said. Now, after breakfast, this is key, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, Peter replied, you know I love you. Then feed my lambs, Jesus told them. Jesus repeated the question. Number two, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know I love you. Then take care of my sheep. The third time, he asked him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt that Jesus asked the question a third time. He said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Then feed my sheep. Three denials. Third time Jesus appears. Three times he asks him the same question. He's bringing him back to the charcoal fire moment. He's revisiting the lowest moment in Peter's life with Peter. And he's saying, Peter, do you love me? Are we Simon here or are we going to be Peter? Because I need you to go feed my sheep. I need you to love people the way I've loved you. Are you going to do it? Simon, come on, man. Three times. He reiterates it time and again. He's calling him into a new, renewed future. It's as, it's as if he's taking this, this incredible moment of pain and Jesus is coming alongside and he's like, no. He's like, this isn't going to be forever, Mark. The smell of this fire and, and, and this moment, it, will not, it, will be not, it is not going to be marked by your denial of me. I am going to redeem that past, that moment, your lowest low, and I am going to do something new with it. Something beautiful, something you have no idea was possible. The very thing you thought was what broke you is going to be the very thing that leads you in a path back to me and back to fruitfulness in the kingdom. This is the redemptive fire of Jesus. And the scriptures tell us that the disciples, he called them, now come and have some breakfast. And Jesus said, none of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. They knew it was the Lord. See, you have lots of questions right now. <laughs> lots of hurts, lots of frustration, lots of doubts, insecurities, 
anger at God, things that you need him to answer for. But if you will just sit in his presence, if you'll accept his invitation to come to the redemptive fire and to let that past be purged and cleansed and purified, if you are willing to take a look at that ugly, all of it, bringing all of you to all of him, then you will know him. You will know that you are his beloved. You will know that he is redeeming your past. And the questions will start to fade into the background, as will all of these other pictures of you. Because the ones that will matter most, that do matter most, these, right here, beloved of God, redeemed by Jesus himself. This is the power of Easter. This was the promise. This is the resurrection power coming, crashing into this world, uprooting, overturning all of the horror of Good Friday and giving us this resurrection power to take beauty from ashes, life from death, meaning and purpose from someone who is constantly sticking his foot in his mouth. How could you not love a guy like Peter when you see everything that he's been through and everything that he would become and, and the foundations that he would lay for the church, for the work we are doing right here today, for the marriages that we see getting restored, for the families that are put back together, for the people who are finding a, a breakthrough in their addictions. Here, right now, this foundation laid by Peter the Rock. Peter the Rock. You. You. He's calling you. And if you, if you knew him, if you knew him, you could rest in that. He wants all of you. Do you love me more than these? Do you love him more than anything else in your life? Do you love us more than the other disciples, than you love your family? Do you love him more than you love your work, like fishing? Do you love him more than everything else? Do you love him more than your past pain? And you're hurt. Do you love me more than all of these things? And he'll ask you and he'll ask you again and he'll ask you again. Because he's calling you in and he's releasing you into this beautiful future. We're going to do something a little bit different here this morning as a way of responding to this service. Because we know a lot of you, we've been getting phone calls, emails, and we know a lot of you are, are taking this series to heart. And you're trying to figure out how is it that I can get past my past. And so the band is going to be coming out. I'm going to ask the care pastors and some other leaders that, that we've talked to to come on up and stand up here on this side. And what we're going to be doing here is just, it's a little different than some things we've done before, but we want to give you some extra space, a little bit of time here this morning so that you can continue to experience some of this healing. And so the care pastors and some other leaders, they have some an oil and they're going to be praying a prayer of blessing up here in the corner. The band is going to be playing. And this is the blessing. It captures everything that we've been talking about this morning. It's, beloved, may your past pain lead to God's loving presence. Now, if you don't want to participate, you don't have to. There's no pressure here. This is for those of you who want the symbol of the healing power of Jesus to speak into your past pain, your past moments, frozen in time, and you want the redemptive power of Jesus in those moments. That's, that's who this is for. And so uh, in just a minute, I'm going to invite you guys to start coming up. I'm going to ask everyone who wants to have this prayer of blessing prayed over them and to be anointed with oil. Why oil? Because for some of you, that might be a little bit unusual, a little bit weird, but in the scriptures, we're told that if a person needs healing, you bring them to the elders of the church and they will anoint them with oil, a symbol of the Spirit's power, a symbol of healing. Jesus himself was anointed before his crucifixion. And as a symbol of that power, the, the, the presence coming into your life will anoint your head with oil, will pray a blessing over you, and then you can make your way over to this side where the Lord's table is, the elements. And so the band is just going to keep playing. If you want a blessing, line up on that side. If you're in the back, kind of work your way around that side and come down this side and then walk your way right over here. For those that are going to pass on a blessing, then you can head right to the table, pick up an element, and you take those elements back to your, your, your seat. And then you can receive it anytime 
uh, during this song. But just give us some space and give us some time. We have some more worship coming after this moment, but we wanted to create some space for those that want to hear from God, experience His healing touch today. And so I'm going to ask all of you to stand. And those that want to be prayed for up here, I'm going to make my way down there as well. I'm going to ask you to start making your way over there and the rest heading that way.